Well, welcome everybody to Christian Assembly. My name is Alex. I'm glad that you've joined us today. We've come to lift up the name of Jesus, the name that is above every other name. And the Bible gives them a lot of names, and we're going to sing about them today. So let's sing this song, The Beginning and the Ending. These are the names of God. The beginning and the ending, the creator. These are the names of God, mighty warrior, consuming fire, Abba Father. These are the names of God, line of Judah, from foundation, our high tower. Of God, gentle whisper, intercessor, he's our helper. Oh, these are the names of God. There is power. The Messiah, our Redeemer, the Rewarder, oh, these are the names of God, man of sorrows, friend of sinners, the Good Shepherd, these are the names of God, he's the author of salvation. Our teacher, oh, these are the names of God. He's our healer and our shelter. He's our portion. Oh, these are the names of God. There is power in His name. There is healing in His name. There's salvation. Place 
Worship is a mighty word, so we declare one last time. Cause our God, a mighty warrior, you're a consuming fire. In victory you reign, we triumph in your name. Jesus, the great commander, you conquered death forever. the great commander you conquered death forever in victory reign. we triumph in your name alright let's just sing it and we declare your name is power and we declare your name is power exalted one your name is higher you stand alone our strong Above you there's no other, above you there's no other, above you there's no other. I got a mighty warrior, I got a mighty warrior, you're a consuming fire, in victory you reign, we triumph in your name, Jesus the great commander, you conquered death forever.
we do. We do. We celebrate that truth today that our God on our behalf and the, the way that he laid down his life for you and me, that's the way that our God has conquered hell, death, sin, and the grave, and we are called to be like him. In uh, the, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 5, there's a story that tells us that uh, Jesus with his, was his, with his followers one day, and they were fishermen. And after a long day of fishing, they had caught nothing. And Jesus came to be with them, and he told them, why don't you try to cast your nets out a little further this time? And uh, they were hesitant, but they said, because it's you, Lord, we'll, we'll do it because you've asked us to. And they had such an astonishing catch of fish that the boat started sinking. And Peter turned to Jesus and he said, get away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. That's the kind of God that invites you today to follow him. A God who is calling you out to the deep a God who is calling you further than your faith has ever gone before. In fact, that's where your greatest weakness meets God's incredible strength. And so uh, Bree wrote this song a couple years ago for a fusion retreat, and this is called Deep Waters, and I pray that it would bless you and minister to you.
Take a moment and think about those times where you've met God in the deep place where your faith has been tested and God has shown himself to be faithful and true. I want you that to encourage you in your faith. We say you've done it, and so we can trust you to bring that which you started into completion. We trust you in your faithfulness, oh God. So would you do it again in us? We sing. I seen you move, you move the mountains, and I believe I see you do it again. You made a way where there was no way, and I believe I see you do it again. I see you. still stands great is your faithfulness your faithfulness I'm still in your hands this is my confidence you never sing again your promise still stands your promise still stands great is your faithfulness your faithfulness your hands this is my confidence you never fail me and oh I'll never will forget I never will forget that you never fail me oh I never will forget and I never will forget that you never Well, what a great time it was to be in worship. Thank you to Alex and our worship team for leading us. Would you pray with me as we close our time in worship? So Lord, we thank you so much for the ability to worship you in our homes, in our cars, wherever we might be watching this service right now. Thank you for meeting us in those places. Holy Spirit, would you be with us? Would you reignite a passion for worship in us once again, Father God? We thank you for the opportunity to gather online, and we also pray for our services at Village. May, uh, may we be blessed as we lift up our worship offering before you. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us for our online services. I'm so glad that you're with us today. My name is Marvin, and I want to say a special welcome to any guests or visitors that are joining us. We're so grateful that you found us and that you're with us for our online worship service. I want to invite all of the men to join me for the men's gathering. That's going to be happening this Thursday at 7 p.m. Mark has a powerful message for us men. You can join me and hundreds of other men as we band together to follow Jesus 
together. You can register for the, for the event and get more information on our CA website. Registration is free, but please go ahead and let us know that you're coming. And also a quick me- mention about another exciting event happening in the world of men's ministry. You can discover what that exciting event is if you go to our Men of CA Facebook page and just look on our socials. It's a really exciting announcement, so don't miss it. Did you know that we also have life groups that meet in person and online, you can find your people to do greater community with, to be connected and grow in your walk with Jesus. So whether you want to meet in person or online, don't be isolated, but go to our website and find a group or learn how you can also lead a group at that website. We thank you for your continuing giving. You can always uh, find ways to give online through our Christian Assembly LA app, or you can go to our website and simply click on the Give tab. Again, we want to say thank you for your ongoing generosity. This week, we get to take a look at baptism. So we're going to look at this video about baptisms, and we're going to celebrate lives being changed by Jesus. And then after that, we'll continue on in our service. My name is Porter. My freshman year of high school was the worst year of my life. I was very lost, making lots of bad decisions and constantly hating myself. I could never let go of the decisions I regretted. I began to pray to God for help. I prayed and prayed and slowly things got better. I started going to church again and about a year ago I accepted Jesus into my life. He has given me clarity and I can trust him more than anyone else I know. This is very reassuring and I want to be baptized as a step forward trusting God to heal me and bless me. Porter, because of your faith in Jesus, we baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. My name is Esther. Before I gave my life to Christ, I worry a lot and rely on myself to fix my problems. I decided to fully trust Jesus after a sermon in the Hope Found Here series. I realized that Jesus was the only way to God, that I was a sinner and needed His redemption. I really wanted to be sure that I would be spending eternity in heaven alongside my sisters, my mom, and my dad. Esther, because of your faith in Jesus, we baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Welcome to my CA family. I want to say how glad I am that you are with us today. And I want to add a special welcome to any guests or visitors, especially those of you who were with us for Easter last weekend for the very first time and decided to join us again. We are so glad that you are back with us here at Christian Assembly. And we hope that not only are you encouraged in your spirit and in your life, but that you're also encouraged to get connected here at Christian Assembly. Please reach out to us if we can help get you connected to Christian Assembly in some way. Today, I have the honor of beginning a new series entitled, No Matter What. Thomas Jefferson is famous to have been quoted saying, in this world, nothing can be said to be certain except death and taxes. And doesn't that seem true? Nobody gets out of this life alive. And while you're here, somebody is going to tax you. Of course, I would add just one more third thing to this list of certainties that it's certain that there will be death, there will be taxes, and it's certain that next year will be the Dallas Cowboys year. You can count on it. Of course, the truth is, while death and taxes may be certain, the last year that we have been through together has taught us many lessons about uncertainty and instability. So many people became uncertain about things that they were once so certain about before. Our health, for example, that I can go to the grocery store and not get sick used to seem pretty certain to us. 
careers and business, that the place where I work will have its doors open tomorrow used to be much more certain than it is today. Travel, that I can buy an airplane ticket or a bus ticket and go anywhere in the world that I want to go at any time used to be more certain. And I'm not even going to go into the uncertainty of our political system and the places of government and our political processes. I don't want the email, so I'm not going to touch that one. But let's just say uncertainty surrounds all of those things. And in these areas and more, the last year has revealed to us that it's not always as steady. It's not always as certain as we like to think it is. You hope that you can count on these things. But that's not always the case. With so many of the things we once thought to be certain no longer that way, it begs the question, what can we be certain of? What can we rely on? The title of our series comes from 1 Peter chapter 5 at the end of verse 12, which, where Peter writes this. My purpose in writing is to encourage you And assure you that the grace of God is with you no matter what happens. We're going to begin our series going back to the beginning of 1 Peter, starting in chapter 1, where Peter writes this. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those living as exiles dispersed abroad in Pontus, Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit to be obedient and to be sprinkled with the blood of Jesus Christ. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. Blessed be the God and Father of our, Lord, of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. You are being guarded by God's power through faith, for a salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. You rejoice in this. Even though now, for a short time, if necessary, you suffer grief in various trials. Let's pray together as we prepare to dive into God's word. Lord, I pray that you would speak to us through your word today. Jesus, I thank you that your grace is certain to us. It is there for us no matter what. I pray that as we read your word today that you would speak to us by the power of your spirit. We listen for your voice in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's set a little context before we work our way through today's verses. The author is Peter. And if you have read the Gospels of Jesus, you're familiar with Peter. Peter was a fisherman from the Galilee area, a northern lake and agricultural center in Israel. Jesus found Peter tending his nets by the Sea of Galilee after a long night of fishing. And he called Peter to follow him. And Peter did just that. The Bible tells us he left everything behind to follow Jesus and to become one of his disciples. Peter would spend the next three years following Jesus as one of his disciples, following him and learning from him. And during this time, Peter experienced what we might call some highs and some lows. Peter walked on water and Peter sank in water. Peter proclaimed Jesus to be the Messiah, the first disciple to do so. Peter then put his foot in his mouth and inadvertently spoke the words of Satan to Jesus by trying to stop his death on the cross. Peter was present at the transfiguration of Jesus and saw him in his glory. At the transfiguration, Peter again put his foot in his mouth and had to be interrupted by God the Father. Peter defended Jesus when the mob came to arrest him. Peter denied knowing Jesus to a little girl who had seen them together. Peter was rebuked and corrected by Jesus. Peter was comforted and restored. 
by Jesus. In short, Peter had firsthand experience in needing grace and on receiving grace. Peter's story is such an encouragement to me. Too often, I feel like we think our discipleship of Jesus should always be up and to the right, to use an investing term. We think that it's always going to be positive. We're always going to make the right choice. We're always going to do the right thing. But that isn't Peter's story, and that isn't my story. Peter blew it. Time and time again. And there are moments in my story when I can look back and think, yeah, that wasn't a great decision. That's a moment I regret that I wish I could do differently. And I bet Peter would say that too. But through those mistakes, Peter learned the lesson of our series. That through Jesus, God's grace is there for you no matter what. Peter's dependence on the grace of God, it wasn't just theoretical and it wasn't just a theological concept. It was real life for Peter. The grace of Jesus met Peter where the rubber meets the road. And that's good news because that means it's real life for me and it's real life for you. Let's work our way through these verses today. Starting in verse 1, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to those chosen living as exiles dispersed abroad in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, chosen, he says. The letter begins by Peter identifying himself, and then he states who the letter is intended for. The church in what we would now would call Turkey. These were most likely Gentiles who had accepted Christ as the message of Jesus went beyond the Jewish world and reached out into the surrounding nations. He refers to them as living as exiles. And when he does this, he hearkens back to a time when the nation of Israel went into exile, being removed from their home and being forced to live among foreign people who did not agree with their beliefs or their lifestyle. The truth is, these people probably weren't literally exiles, but instead Peter identifies them as that because they are now chosen by God. They live like exiles in a foreign place. See, the audience of this letter was doing their best to follow Jesus in a context where some people, they couldn't care less about the gospel. Yet others didn't know the gospel at all, and still others were upset or against the gospel. Sometimes it might feel that way for us. Like we are exiles from a different place. It can feel that way where when everywhere you turn, you see something that opposes the gospel of Jesus. When everywhere you look, you see a message of relativism, of your truth, my truth, everybody gets their own truth, which flies in the face of the absolute truth that we find in scripture. Or maybe uh, when everywhere you look, you see messages, messages of cancel culture, which flies in the grace provided by Jesus and the grace that says you are not canceled because of your mistakes. The gospel of Jesus is the opposite of cancel culture. In fact, the only thing canceled in the gospel of Jesus is your sin and your mistakes. Of course, we repent of our sin. And at times, our mistakes might have consequences in this life. This isn't about people escaping all of the consequences of their actions. But the message of Jesus is that you are not canceled. And holding to a belief like that in a time when it seems like anything and everything is at risk of getting canceled at any minute can cause us to feel like we are exiles living in a foreign place. The truth is, if you are in Christ, this world is no longer your home. You are a citizen of heaven, the Bible tells us. And actually, it should come as an encouragement to those of us who are following Jesus when we recognize that we no longer feel completely at home here. As the kingdom of heaven makes its way into your life more and more, the things of this world will feel out of place to you more and more to people living like exiles because they are now citizens of heaven, Peter says, you have been chosen by God. 
this language of being a chosen people, it was formerly once reserved for the nation of Israel. Israel was God's chosen people. But now, because of Jesus, all who believe now become a part of a chosen people. If you are doing your best to follow Jesus, despite the fact that so many parts of our culture and world seem opposed to it and resist it, it may, might make you feel like you don't fully belong in this place, like it's not actually your home. Be encouraged today as you read Peter's words to the ancient church. You are chosen by God because God saw fit to choose you. And as you do your best to follow Jesus in a post-Christian secular culture, God's grace is there for you no matter what. Moving on to verse two, Peter says, you've been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit to be obedient and to be sprinkled with the blood of Jesus Christ. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. Notice the presence of all three members of the Trinity here in this verse. We have the Father knowing ahead of time his plan to save those who would come to Christ. We have the Spirit doing the work of sanctification, transforming us from what we once were into the image and person of Jesus. And we have Jesus, the Son, sacrificially giving his precious blood so that sinners like you and like me would have access to the Father's plan of salvation. I've noticed that depending on the type of church that you grew up in or maybe on, your, on how you were discipled, people can tend to lean toward one member of the Trinity over the others in their prayers and how they think about God. Some people only ever pray to Father God. And you can tell that this is true for them because they say the phrase Father God at least two times in every sentence of their prayers. Some people only talk to and interact with Jesus. Some people only talk to and focus on the Holy Spirit, his power and his miracles. And if a Holy Spirit miracle didn't take place, then God didn't move. But notice that for Peter, All of God is involved in salvation. All three members of the Trinity, Father, Son, Spirit, one God, three distinct persons, all present and all active, working on your behalf so that you get to be a part of the plan of salvation that stretches back to eternity past. If you ever feel insignificant or unnoticed or like maybe you don't matter, remind yourself that at some point there was a conversation that took place among the members of the Trinity in their perfect love and in their communication as they said to each other, I love, insert your name, so much. We have to do something to get them back. And at that conversation about you, the decision was made for Jesus to go to the cross. God the entirety of who he is, decided to send Jesus and Jesus chose to go to the cross for you. But as we celebrated last weekend, Jesus didn't stay dead. As verse three tells us, blessed be the the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ because of his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Listen, we don't just talk about the resurrection once a year at Easter. Now, it's always so fun to celebrate Easter together. But for Peter, the resurrection of Jesus wasn't an event to be celebrated once with hidden eggs and honey baked ham. But the resurrection of Jesus was a lifestyle we are invited into. Because of his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Follow this with me. God has great mercy on us. His desire is to spare us from the penalty and death that we deserve. So he gave us new birth, new life, a fresh start, not an opportunity to make up for our shortcomings and failures, but a fresh start, a clean slate, an entire new life in front of us for us to live, a living hope. Hope, the promise of what we do not yet have, but that we can be certain of. How? 
How does God's mercy give us new life and a living hope? Through Jesus' resurrection from the dead. For Peter, everything God has for us is rooted and in and is made available to us through Jesus' resurrection. The central message of the entire word of God is that the Messiah would come to save God's people. And then in the New Testament, that message is sharpened that in the central way of the salvation that God has for us is available through the cross and the resurrection, which now offers us new birth by faith in Christ. All of our hope is rooted in the resurrection. Read Paul's writing from 1 Corinthians 15 sometime. In it, you'll find statements like, and if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. Those then who have fallen asleep in Christ have also perished. If we put our hope in Christ for this life only, we should be pitied more than anyone else. I co-lead a small group of men that gather weekly to learn about and discuss apologetics, the thoughtful understanding and defense of the Christian faith, why we have good reason to believe what we believe. And there are some really important topics that we cover in the huddle. We cover a biblical worldview. We cover postmodernism and naturalism, how science often supports what the Bible teaches. We talk about the reliability of scripture. But of all the lessons we have, my favorite is the historic defense of the resurrection. See, my life was changed when I learned about the historical reliability of the resurrection of Jesus and that Jesus actually, literally rising from the tomb is the most logical explanation of what happened. Michael Williams, my friend and co-leader of the huddle uh, with me, he recently presented a historical defense of the resurrection in our digital discipleship series, Reasons to Believe. And you can find it on our CA social medias. It was released the week before Easter. And if you want to learn more about the reliability of the resurrection, I encourage you to go watch that digital discipleship. But we must become convinced that Jesus actually literally rose from the dead. And that his resurrection changes everything about how we now live our lives. See, I live knowing that the power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in me. I live knowing that I serve a God who brings life to dead things. So I can have faith that the places in my life that seem dead because of sin can be brought back by his power. Marriages can be brought back to life. Dreams can be brought back to life. God's calling on your life that maybe you've walked away from can be brought back to life by God's resurrecting power. We we are a resurrection people. The death that we experience in this world is not the end of the story for us. That's true today in the different areas of our lives. And it's true ultimately when we die. If you are in Christ, death is not the end of the story. Look at what Peter says we have waiting for us in verse four. And into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. Here, Peter speaks of the living hope found in Jesus' resurrection as an inheritance. Biblically, that word used to describe the promised land that God gave to the Israelite people. Now, though, because of Christ, people living like exiles can rest assured that we have an inheritance for us, a home for us. An inheritance is something that once belonged to somebody else, usually a family member, that they decided would go to you upon their death. So when you receive an inheritance, that generally means somebody has passed away and what was theirs now becomes yours. Usually there is a will put in place which declares for everyone that what once belonged to this person has now officially been given to you. Through Jesus' death, what once was his, the new hope and new life that was his, he has now willed to you and to me. And this inheritance is different than the inheritances that we might get here on earth. The inheritance that God gives us is imperishable. It's not subject to decay. It won't go bad. It's undefiled. The world has not yet corrupted. It is holy and righteous. It is unfading. It doesn't grow dim or lose its glory. And it's kept for us in heaven. 
This inheritance that those in Christ now have access to, this new life and this new hope, the promise of grace no matter what is in a safe place, in the very presence of God, which those of us who are in Christ are now currently and constantly experiencing. And here's the thing about an inheritance. When you know you have an inheritance coming to you, it changes how you live your life today. It's amazing how you experience less stress and worry and anxiety when you know you have something great and significant coming to you, that it's promised to you and nothing will take place that will cancel that promise. We live in a fallen world and we will experience pain and frustration and setback in this life. It's a certainty. The thing is, when we as followers of Jesus remember that we have an inheritance waiting for us, suddenly we have the ability to press through. We find the strength to keep going in our calling and toward the purpose that God has for us. We have a new hope and an inheritance waiting for us. And we know that we are going to make it there to that inheritance kept for us in heaven. Verse five tells us, you are being guarded by God's power through faith for a salvation that is ready to be revealed at the last time. See, God has a plan for you at the end of all things. When this story wraps up and God brings his creation into the glorified state that scripture tells us about, you and I, if we are in Christ, we will be a part of it. There's room for you in heaven. There is a place for you in heaven. That's true for a promise in eternity and it's a reality that we experience now. You can count on it. You can trust in it. God is guarding you by his power through faith so you can rest assured that if you are in Christ, salvation is yours no matter what. If you are in Christ, your mistakes do not disqualify you. Your past isn't held against you. Your sin is no longer on your account. So we can rejoice. As Peter writes in verse six, you rejoice in this. Even though now for a short time, if necessary, you suffer grief in various trials. Tom will continue verse seven next week. But let me just say that life on this earth will not be easy. The Bible never promises that it will be, but we can rejoice. Even when we live like exiles among a people who don't believe what we believe, who want to oppose us and at times even persecute us, we rejoice because all of who God is has been working so that you can experience the radical, life-transforming power of Jesus' resurrection and so that you can lay claim to an inheritance that is set kept safe for you in God's very presence. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for the new hope and the new life that we are able to live in. We pray that your word would sink deep into our hearts today. God, for those who feel like exiles living in a land that isn't truly their home, may they remember that it's actually a good thing to feel that way because it's a sign that you, God, are at work in their lives. So would they now be encouraged to press on living boldly for you. For those experiencing death in their life, maybe literal sickness and the threat of death, or maybe it's a death of a relationship, a dream, a career, a calling. Would your resurrection power enter their story? Bring new life where there is none. For those who have been marked by a spirit of joy because of your gospel, we thank you for that. For those whose faith is being guarded and protected, we thank you for that. For those tired, weary people who aren't sure if it's worth it to press on in following you. For those tempted to give up and walk away. Remind us of the inheritance that we have waiting for us in heaven. And someday it will all have been worth it. And we will rest easy in the goodness of your presence and your new life. Would we be marked by your joy and your peace. Trusting in all the good that you have for us. We thank you that your grace is there for us no matter what. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship together as Alex leads us one more time.
I am praying for you, brother. I bow my knee on your behalf. Now I speak your name to our God in heaven, that he might grant you grace and favor. No matter what may ever come your way, any dark, dark night or gloomy day, I promise to pray for you, brother. Lift your name before the Father, cause when we pray for each other, He takes away. Bow my knee on your behalf. Now keep believing that what he started in you will be completed till this life is finally through. And as we share in his grace, watch his mighty hand move. All those mountains in our lives. On his promises stand I promise to pray for you, sister Lift your name before the Father Cause when we pray for each other He takes away the hate When we pray for each other We can share each other's pain Thank you once again for being with us for our online services. If you made a decision to follow Jesus Christ at any point during this service, or if you'd like to know about what it means to follow Christ, let us know. We'll have a pastor follow up with you. You can let us know by emailing us at the email address that's on your screen or on the webpage listed below as well. And I just want to say thank you for being with us once again. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you this week. Thank you, everybody, for being with us.